What's up, guys? It's your girl, Ginger, the true crime queen. I'm reminding you now that listener discretion is advised. The dark nature of the show is not suitable for young ears or those that are sensitive to graphic material. But without further ado, let's get it. Woo! Season three, bitches. All right. Episode 21 is hopefully going to be a totally new and never heard before case. From what I noticed, you're probably only going to know this fucking douchebag if you live in or around Missoula, Montana. But this story is hella awesome too because as one of the happiest endings I've ever gotten to tell. So, my little true crime lovers, today you're going to learn all about the Missoula monster or what I'm going to call him after this. Wayne, not today, Nance. Before I rip into this asshole, I have to mention that not all the victims I'm going to mention today have been confirmed victims of Nance, but there is a large amount of evidence to back up these beliefs, which I obviously have included in the episode sources if you're at all interested in where I find this shit. So, to be clear, I'm going to cover all the supposed victims of Wayne Nance, as well as mention a few details about a still unidentified body that maybe we can get some closure for if someone happens to hear this and connects the dots. Also, this was a hella bad dude. He's sometimes referred to as the Missoula Mauler or the Missoula Monster, but honestly, he should be called the Missoula McDickhead, but there should be some preemptive trigger warnings for sexual assault, but I will also give another heads up per the usual. So, Wayne Nathan Nance was born on October 14th, 1955 in Clinton, Montana. It's a tiny little community 20 minutes outside of Missoula, Montana, so I guess you could call it Missoula, to his parents George and Charlene Nance. I believe his dad served in the Navy, then started long-haul trucking, and his mom was said to have worked at a nearby bar known as The Cabin. And, like, how fucking fitting is that for Montana, right? Like, a bar called The Cabin. So when your husband comes home from work and he says, ah, honey, I'm going up to the cabin, it doesn't sound so bad. Fucking strategic. I like it. If you've never been to Montana, it's super beautiful. It's a big old bunch of nothing, really, but in like the best kind of way. There's lots of national parks and it's super great for the outdoorsy types. But back to Wayne Nance, our dickhead of the day. He was said to have gone to Bonner Elementary School and graduated from Sentinel High. I've read that Though he grew up pretty normally, he was somewhat of the weird kid who was at that time into occult-type shit, and he collected satanic books, wore band tees, and he bragged to other students about killing and sacrificing people. So, like, he actually turns out to be basically the fucking epitome of what the satanic panic was preaching during the 1980s, ironically. He's a little ahead of his time, but... Like, Wayne Nance should be the poster child of the satanic panic now that I mention it. He's exactly like the type of kid that they would have wanted to arrest in the West Memphis 3 case back in the 90s, but this is not a railroad story. Sorry, guys. He is absolutely five pounds of shit in a two-pound bucket. His shit runneth over. His first suspected but unconfirmed victim would be when he was just 18 years old, not even technically out of high school for God's sake, but on April 11th of 1974, the body of Donna Lorraine Pounds was found in the basement of her home in the Bonner West Riverside of Montana. She was a 39-year-old mother and wife to a minister at the local church. And a quick heads up because this does get rough. She was found tied to a chair, believed to have been raped, and then fatally shot five times in the back of the head. Like, how fucking unnecessary is that? Five times? Are you kidding me? You're just wasting your ammo at that point. Come on, dude. But it also was with her own husband's twenty-two. I've even heard reports that this gun was actually found to be shoved inside this woman's hoo-ha. But, I mean, I couldn't really tell you if that's verifiable or not. I do know. The weapon was absolutely found at the scene, but obviously not all the accounts of this incident will go into like that sort of detail. There is a book available on this asshole though, and I'm also going to link that on Amazon. But it turns out the fucking hardcover is like 850 bucks. There must be like three of them. The uh, Amazon Prime edition was only like nine bucks. Anyways, back to the story. At first, Donna's husband was suspected after it was found that he was having an affair 
Remember when I said minister's wife? <laughs> Fucking man of the Lord, my ass. But neighbors actually reported also seeing the 18-year-old Wayne Nance in that family's backyard around the suspected time of the murder. And he just so fucking happens to be a schoolmate of one of Donna's own sons. It would also turn out that her son did previously once show his father's 22 revolver to Wayne Nance and ended up showing him where the family kept it at the same time. Attendance records show that Wayne was not in school that day and Donna had been murdered while she was at home alone during the majority of the day. Wayne has always been highly suspected of the murder of Donna Pounds, though it was never officially confirmed, and you'll soon find out why. A few months following the murder of Mrs. Pounds, Wayne swiftly entered the United States Navy just after his high school graduation in 1974. But it turns out he was later discharged, I believe after serving only three years. He returned to his parents' home just after in 1977, and he's now been suspected of killing even more people than we're aware of, while traveling within the Navy for those three years. So it could be more people that I'm going to mention. So, back in Missoula, Montana, 22-year-old Wayne Nance is scrubbing it up in the basement of his parents' home, working as a delivery driver for a furniture company, as well as doing a part-time thing as a bouncer at this place called the Cabin Bar at nights. Just after the new year of 1980, a train operator sees the badly decomposed body of someone lying along the curb of a fence at the bottom of a steep ravine, and her body was basically nude besides her dress that wound up around her neck by the time that she was discovered. There's cuts found on her ribcage, so examiners believe that she was stabbed to death and then tossed off the roadside when her body likely rolled down the ravine to the fence line where it was discovered. And basically, she wasn't identified for some amount of time, so she was named Betty Beavertail, being that she was found near what's called the Beavertail Hill State Park. Her body was eventually found to be that of a 15-year-old girl, Devonna Nelson. 15 fucking years old, you guys. Later, in the fall of 1985, on September 9th, a bear hunter came across a human skull scattered among some bones within a gully who had eventually been dubbed Christy Crystal Creek because of the area that she was found in, and no identification of her has ever been made. She was believed to have been killed sometime in the two years prior to her discovery, so this person probably would have went missing between 83 and 85. And she was found to be shot at close range, twice with a 32 caliber weapon. So at the end of today's episode, I will get back to this unidentified body and give you a couple more details. And maybe we can nip that one in the butt and hopefully connect anybody to a long lost relative. But literally just three months after this Christie's body was found. A wildlife photographer looking for some great shots in the heart of winter there in Montana was hiking around Bonner Dam on what is, I'm sure, the perfect Christmas Eve when he literally sees this frostbitten, black, but like clearly a human leg sticking out of the snow. And there's like no question on what he sees because it's literally like a thigh growing out of the ground, complete with an ankle and a foot at a 90 degree angle. So he has to hike back down to his car and go inform the police, which then they have to come up on the snowy ass area on Christmas Eve and literally have to unthaw this body using a tent and some heaters for two days before they actually end up deciding that they're just going to gently chip this body out because it's somewhat still buried under like two feet of frozen ass hard ground. It was in a shallow grave and then the ground froze over. And I'll remind you, she was found on Christmas Eve, so it's literally cold as fuck. And when they are eventually able to recover this body, they found that she was also nude and had suffered three headshots, one to the back of her skull, and two to the temple. Again, why? Why is that necessary? You would think with one close range shot, you're probably good. But why would you ever need to shoot someone three times in the head? Extra as fuck, if you ask me. She was also unable to be immediately identified, so her nickname was Debbie Deer Creek, again because of the area in which her remains were discovered. But later on down the line, she does get identified, so we'll come back to her. So over in a different county in Montana, it turned out that a couple weeks before this body was found, a pretty big unsolved crime happened. 
It was the evening of December 12th in 1985, and an intruder had somehow gained access inside the home of Mike and Teresa Shook, who were parents to three young children. And upon his entrance, their intruder held them at gunpoint while forcing one to tie up the other. He ends up killing both of them before deciding to kill everyone in the house by setting it on fire. The neighbors of the Shooks were actually able to notice the smoke that was brewing inside the house and were able to save the three kids who had apparently fallen unconscious due to smoke inhalation. So to be clear, all three children of that family actually lived, thankfully, but it would seem apparent that someone is not fucking around in Missoula and three dead unidentified girls with two home invasions ending in pretty brutal murders and the sheriffs in Missoula do not have a suspect at the moment. Nine months down the road, on September 8th of 1986, we're guessing Wayne picked the wrong fucking ones to play with. And being that he had also had a daytime job working as a furniture store delivery driver, Nance would actually be the guy that would bring you your new sofa if you'd bought one at this local furniture store. Well, it was alleged that Wayne had some obvious hots for his female manager named Chris who had worked the sales floor of the store and managed it and Chris and Wayne are somewhat work acquaintances but I would not really go as far to assume that they were friendly because Chris was married and Wayne apparently didn't care Wayne decides to show up at the home of this manager Chris and her husband Doug so apparently he comes over and knocks on their door and asks to borrow a flashlight or something and Doug, for whatever reason, allows Nance inside the home, so he turns around to go grab whatever it is that he needed, and that's when Wayne fucking hits this guy in the back of the head. And I've read that Doug didn't really like Wayne anyway, but I'm sure that's the last thing that he thought it was going to happen. I'm assuming he only let him in because his wife and the guy were work acquaintances, but he then forces the woman, Chris, to tie her husband, Doug, up while at gunpoint. He then leaves Doug tied up in the living room, and I guess he then takes Chris into the upstairs bedroom and binds her to their bed. And then Wayne Nance then leaves the bedroom, and he goes back to Doug and forces him into their home's basement, where he binds Doug to one of the supporting beams of the house. And heads up, because this also kind of gets rough, but this is when Wayne takes the time to beat the shit out of a tied-up, defenseless Doug. When in the end of it, he apparently just decides he's going to pull out a knife and stab Doug anyway. Like, why bother beating someone up if you're just going to stab him? That's psychotic. Doug describes this fucking asshole as Wayne then took the knife and wiped the blood off onto Doug's shirt. And he then proceeded to go back upstairs towards Chris and leaves Doug to bleed out in the basement tied to the beam. Doug, though... <laughs> Doug is actually really into guns himself and just so happened to be repairing one of his special rifles, a Model 99 Savage, and this gun was laying out on a table next to where Doug was tied up and he actually managed to wiggle out of these ties and load up one bullet that he had there as well. So with one bullet and the super ass old rifle, with the shit kicked out of him and a stab wound, Doug proceeds to walk upstairs to save his wife, Chris, from this fucking creep who left him to die in the basement. Like, yas, Doug. Doug knows that this intruder also has a gun, so he had the forethought to draw Nance out of the bedroom rather than, like, burst in and shoot him. So he takes the butt of the rifle that he's carrying and he bangs it along the walkway of the staircase. Wait, so obviously Wayne falls for this shit and walks straight out into Doug's line of sight where he's able to fire the single shot into Wayne's leg. Wayne falls down and he begins crawling back towards the bedroom where he left his gun. So Doug is doing everything he can to stop Nance. Like he literally broke the stock off his rifle and bent the barrel of this gun, beating the shit out of Wayne Nance so he doesn't get back and hurt his wife. But Nance is still able to grab his gun and shoot Doug once more in the leg but Doug is still fucking trying to beat Wayne away from this gun and accidentally knocks the lamp off the table, which ends up making the entire room dark. Now, I've read this ending in many different ways. It's sort of like a choose-your-own-adventure at this point, but a couple sources indicate that two shots went off after the lights went out. 
One of them was a mess, and the other ended up in Nance's temple. Another source said that Doug was able to get the gun away from Nance, and he then shot him point blank. And then another source explained that Doug hit Nance in the arm with the butt of his rifle, which actually forced Nance, who was shooting, to shoot himself when he was hit in the arm with the butt of the gun, sort of ending in like an unintended suicide. So I can imagine almost all three. Also, one source indicated that Nance obviously felt the jig was up and purposely shot himself to end it all. So either way, when the lights came back on, Doug and Chris were able to call 911 and Wayne Nance ended up dying in the early morning hours of September 4th of 1986 in the emergency room of the St. Patrick's Hospital. And he died at the age of 30, which is pretty young, but definitely well-deserved. And that was the last time he would ever fucking break into any of these houses and be killing any of these women, all thanks to Doug Wells. And for this reason, I would like to call him Wayne, not today, Nance. When the police searched the home of Wayne Nance, looking for any clues that might link him to these other crazy-ass crimes that had been unsolved, but I guess the bounds on the bed and the bounds in the family that were shot looked very similar, so investigators actually discover a few items that had been reported stolen from that Shook family home, where he lit the house on fire, but the kids survived. One of the items was a big old ceramic, like a glass elk. You know, it's like this mini statue you use to decorate your, like, cabin with or whatever, as well as one particular knife from a set found in the Shook's home. And both of those items were found stolen after the murders, and both of those items ended up being within Wayne Nance's fucking home. But also, they found a picture of George Nance there on the mantle next to this fucking ceramic elk, where on the back of this picture, it's dated Christmas 1985. Like, it was a present from Wayne to his father, George, or some shit, which is pretty gross. That's pretty gross. So Debbie Deer Creek, the body that wasn't identified at the time, it had been buried in the snow and was eventually able to be identified in the spring of 2006 via dental records. And it turns out to be a 16-year-old girl named Marcella Marcy Bachman, who had apparently been reported as a runaway over in Vancouver, Washington. And the 16-year-old Marcy is actually believed to be the girl that Wayne Nance was seen with a few times, who he had claimed to other people that worked in his bar that he had taken her in when she was dropped off at a nearby truck stop. The girl was going by the name Robin and mentioned that she was just passing through town. I read that Marcy's brother, Derek, had actually been looking for her since she went missing even to the degree of using a private investigator. But he kind of always ended up assuming, because of the lack of information, that she was likely a victim of the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, who was the most active serial killer that their area was dealing with. But some hair that was found in Wayne Nance's home after he died was actually said to be a similar match to this Marcy's hair, whose hair had been previously dyed. So the patterns of dye in her hair and grow out actually matched up, pretty much confirming that this 16-year-old Marcy, who was going by Robin, was the body that they found in the snow. And friends of Nance mentioned that the last time that they remember ever seeing her was when Nance brought her to a little end-of-the-summer turn-up on September 28th of 1985, which would align with the examiner's approximation of her death. So Wayne didn't get an opportunity to be tried or convicted. However, I think he got exactly what was fucking coming to him. The unconfirmed deaths do have his MO written all over them, though I would really love, love, love for this last woman to get identified. So I'm going to recap on her details for anyone who might know anything about a long lost aunt or a grandma of possible Asian descent. She would have been a very small lady, somewhere between 4'10 and 5'2, and they estimated that she weighed between 90 and 110 pounds. And she was found to have a lot of very good dental work prior to her death, including a couple of root canals. So definitely ask, you know, your older generations if anyone has ever went missing, 
especially if it's in the area of Montana or the Pacific Northwest, give or take, and if it's at all possible that they would have been in the area at the time. But yeah, Wayne, not today Nance, is literally one of the worst things to ever crawl out of the asshole of Montana. I gotta say, I loves me a happy ending, though. So even if we're not exactly sure what happened, it's kind of in that way up to our imagination, and I can rest with whatever because that mofucker got exactly what was coming. But I gotta say, my listeners are super fucking awesome because during my break, I got so much love and, like, positive feedback. I absolutely, seriously, I appreciate everyone who took the time. I got some quick patrons to holla at as well as some love that I got in the Apple review section. Some new patrons are Selena, Amelia, Cheryl, and Ryan. I, You guys, I truly appreciate your patronage and I sincerely hope that you're enjoying the bonus episodes that I'm making especially for you. And in the Apple ratings and reviews, I got a lot of love. Um, Shelly D, V Dells W, Lynn Olive, here for the reviews, Macy Spencer, Brooklyn Muse, 79, Tabby, Accor Bello, 92, and Lulz, 7, changed their review from a 1 to a 5-star review. And I noticed that you changed your rating, and I fucking love that shit. So, of course, thank you. But obviously, thank you all so much for your dope-ass reviews. Every one of those helps, like, my podcast get more popular. So, thanks so much. Next week, we're going to dive into one of the most notorious cases in true crime history that hasn't technically been solved yet. I have quite a surprising theory for you guys. But overall, this case played a major part in how investigations now are handled. Today. Right now. So, I'll see you back in two weeks for that specially requested case, actually. And that was the tea. I hope you enjoyed my rendition of the story, and if so, please tell all your creepy ass friends about it. You can find the sources I used for the episode in its description. You can find me slinging those memes on Instagram at True Crime Queen. Check them out if you need some laughs after all this dark shit. If you'd like to support the podcast, check out my Patreon at Ginger the True Crime Queen. As always, remember to lock those fucking doors, you guys. All right, bye.